Hi, my name is Rachel and today we're talking about Desperate Measures by Katie Robert. I'm gonna tell you what happened in this book, which is Shradica. It's first like 20 seconds of the video, so I have to be careful lest YouTube get upset with me. Desperate Measures is the first book in Katie Roberts' Wicked Villains series. What kind of villains? Disney ones. Disney villains. This particular book is set in Carver City, a fictional city made up by Katie Robert, but you'll recognize the names of our protagonists, Jasmine and Jafar. Assumedly, this book came to be because Katie Robert watched this scene from Aladdin Go on. And your beard is so twisted. And like many of us later in life, watched it again and was like, am I into this a little bit, maybe? And behold, this book happened. At least that's what I assume. This is a separate series from her Dark Olympus series, which is set in Olympus. I reviewed the first one, Neon Gods. You can check that out if you'd like. It's linked down below. And I think that in some ways this was better than Neon Gods, but also in some ways it was worse than Neon Gods. And in some ways it was exactly the same as Neon Gods. What an experience. Am I right? Part of the problem is that when things are shmerotica, <clears throat> it doesn't really satiate my need for like a very tidy plot arc and well-rounded character arcs. Books are like cake. Everybody has a favorite cake type and icing combo. You have to find the one that meets your needs. Speaking of meeting your needs, my friends over at Belessa and I are sending out free vibrators and free gift cards for vibrators to everybody who signs up to my giveaway down below. If you don't know, Belessa is a bi women company for all things sexuality, so erotica, but also sex toys and porn and sex ed, which is really important to me. Belessa's mission is to empower everybody to embrace and celebrate and learn about their sexuality. They have a wide range of products so everybody can find something that they love that will work for them. If you're a beginner, you can check out the Demi one, which is really simple. It's a vibrator. It's very flexible and it's just a one button. So you just hold it down. Not very fancy, but it gets the job done. And it's great for beginners. If you are scared of all the buttons and all the possibilities, this is perfect for you. It's also super quiet. So nobody's going to know. And it's very adjustable, like seriously, very adjustable. This is no patterns. It's just a vibrator. Anybody can use it. Great for all bodies. Everybody deserves sex toys that they love. They also sent me the pebble, which is so cute. I love rose gold and pink. This has suction and vibration, which are controlled independently but it's just two buttons it's really simple it's also really small really ergonomic this is the air vibe it's a little more fancy it is a vibrator it has g-spot stimulation and it's got suction and it's also silent but deadly and this is the thumb this is the one I tell all my friends to get this is a toy that does it all even if you're a beginner but you want a variety you can try this one the whole thing is a vibrator but it's also got suction and this part thumps Trust me when I tell you, you will not regret this. You will not regret buying this. This is designed to be like the toy that can do it all. All of these are waterproof and USB rechargeable. They come in these charging cases that are very discreet and all of them are made from quality silicone. They also hold charge better than a lot of other brands that I have tried because nobody likes when their toys die. So that's important. They come in these discreet cases so nobody's gonna know. They are waterproof, which yes, is obviously important if you are getting dirty, but also you need to be cleaning your toys. So cleaning them is no issue and make sure you clean your toys after every use. And you can get your free gift card or vibe by clicking the link down below. And thank you so much to Belessa for sponsoring today's video. So let me give you the trigger warnings for this in case you're interested in reading it. That is something that I'm trying to do more. I'm trying to remember to do that more. So in the book, there is consensual non-consent sex scenes. Uh, there are threats of sexual assault. There is death of a parent. There is murder off page and on page. There is kidnapping and there is mentions of child abuse in the main character's history. This is a lot of like daddy baby girl kink. So if you are not into that, this will not work for you. It's not really my thing. So I didn't love this book. But those of you who that is your thing, this is your cake flavor. You might eat this shit up. There is a sex dungeon, which is kind of, I, I learned kind of typical for Katie Roberts books. There is a threesome. There is sex in front of other people. So just be aware that this is very much erotica and there's some kinky shit going on. Okay, I had to come back and finish filming this. Sorry for the change. So we are in the territory of Jasmine and her dad, 
Balthazar. We start out this book and we find out Jasmine's in her room and she can hear somebody walking into her room. No, it's not Abu. And she also tells us that it's setting up the story very quickly where it's setting up that her dad had just told her that day before she fell asleep that he had sold her essentially in marriage and he slapped her for asking about it. We never see this guy on page. He's just there to be the bad guy. And so this sort of like, you know how, you know the difference between been, like watching a movie and then watching like the porn version of a movie it kind of feels like that okay so jasmine's dad sucks he's not like that short man in the aladdin movie he is a meanie pants so who's walking into her room who could it be is it aladdin no it's not it's jafar he comes into her room and she's about to stab him right in the dick and they get into a verbal sparring match which apparently they have been doing for the last five years but they have a code word i don't know how they decided on this code word because up to this point it seems like they've never really had a conversation about what's going on between them but they do have a code word and it is Raja like the tiger from the okay we're on chapter one and she's already thinking about and commenting on his cock why am I not surprised we don't really understand the dynamic between them at this point it becomes a little clearer later that there's always like dangerous flirting going on and so she's like will my buyer still want me the guy who bought me to marry uh still want me if i'm tarnished goods and i'm like hold on a minute didn't we just do this with neon gods like is this not a repeat of neon gods where it's like the woman is tarnished if she has sex virgin woman now tarnished sold in marriage and like i get that a lot of fantasies are like 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 sexual fantasies are like repeats but this is a book like couldn't we do something a little 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 different than that anyway so Jafar's like your father is gone he's dead by the way the territory is mine you're mine Jasmine and I'm like oh great resand is that you so they reinforce again that Raja is her safe word so at any point she could say Raja and this will stop he says to her you can go and she's like if I leave you're gonna take my inheritance my money and I was like oh this is kind of almost exactly like Neon Gods, except Hades wasn't going to take her money. It's, it's very, it's very similar in a way that I'm like, womp womp. So he's like, run. And if you make it to the front door, you can have your trust fund. But if you don't make it, you're mine, body and soul. And I'm like, oh, again, Resan's come back. Why am I not surprised? And she's like, Jafar, he promised my father loyalty, blah, blah, blah. How terrible. What a bad, bad man. So he gives her to the count of 10. She runs. He <laughs> catches her and they have dubious consent sex. This is chapter one. So I was a little bit thrown. It comes out later that both of them knew that at any point she could say Raja and that it would stop. I was a little thrown reading this to me because it felt a little bit rapey, but apparently that they make it clear that later on she could have said her safe word at any point. So her dad hit her, right? And Jafar realizes it and he's like slightly perturbed about it. And I'm like, okay, but didn't you just like, didn't you just tackle her to the floor and then, oh, okay, sure. So Richard, a guy on her protective detail who, only shows up for this scene is like hey boss are we gonna get to fuck her or not and Jafar is like she's mine which is a phrase um that I'm gonna have to take away from authors forever and ever I'm sorry nobody's allowed to use it anymore we're done I'm gonna hear it a million times I'm guessing at this point and then they leave together and he's like listen nobody's gonna touch you and she's like you just did and he says yeah and I'm gonna do it again so is it nobody or just you he's like I'm gonna do it again and again and again and I'm like okay so it's so somebody's gonna touch her and it's you but she's into it and that's the point because it's consensual while being played off as non-consensual they have a safe word which they both know she chose not to use it I'll allow it it's just a little silly which sort of like breaks the fantasy of it for me and I can't help but laugh which sucks because like I would like to get sucked in but I'm still laughing I will say that's a personal problem that I have with these books other people are gonna get sucked in and that's fine then we switch to Jafar's POV. And here's the good news. Mr. Moorcock, who narrated Neon Gods, is not the narrator for Jafar. So I didn't have to listen to that guy try to sound sexy again and want to stab myself in the ear holes. So that was nice. He's like, ugh, fuck Jasmine's dad for hitting her. Everything he has is mine now. He's such a dick for hitting her. Whereas personally, when I hit a woman, she gets off on it. And at this point, I am desperately wishing that this was not written in first person because imagine thinking these things to yourself. That's weird shit, man. Why are you thinking about that? That's weird shit. Be normal. Yeah,
be a normal human. So he takes her to his penthouse, which is basically the only place she's ever gone because her dad was even more controlling than this guy somehow. And he's like, all right, let's make some terms. And I'm like, wait, so we are making a deal now? Why didn't we make a deal previously? And that's really my problem with this whole book is that they could have made a deal at any point. They just didn't. And that just felt like miscommunication-y, which is very much not my thing. At least this is better than redeeming love in the whole making terms thing. At least in this, unlike redeeming love, Love, there's a safe word. Whereas in redeeming love, when the Christian man demands sex, there is no saying no to him. So yikes. I shouldn't even make that comparison, honestly, because the difference is that this is not prescriptive. This book this is not prescriptive. It's a safe way to play out certain kinks people have in a way where they don't actually get into an abusive relationship in real life, whereas redeeming love is actually prescribing an abusive relationship onto a generation of Christian women. No, I'm not joking. So he doesn't let anyone else live at his house and he only fucks at the club. Yep, there's a sex club again, just like Neon Gods. Feels awfully similar to Hades from neon gods but all right so he's like i'm gonna head out and uh when i get back i want you naked and kneeling by the door and she's like when will you be back and he says oh before dawn and she's like so you want me to be there for some indeterminate amount of time and he's like yeah exactly okay bye and he's thinking to himself my cock is so hard it's hard to see straight and as a person without a dick personally i just want to ask if that is a thing legitimately <laughs> I would go downstairs and ask Carlos, but I think he's taking a nap and I don't want to wake him up for this. Anyways, he's like, but business has to come before pleasure, even if fucking Jasmine is business. So business has to come before pleasure, even though fucking Jasmine is business. So, but she's, but she's business. See, this is not working for me. <laughs> I don't have enough brain cells left for this. She likes computers, which is a thing that comes up all of twice. And she tries to log into his computer and it starts recording like whenever someone puts in the wrong password. So he gets an alert on his phone and he's not watching her, but he calls her and she's like, you know what I'll do? I will masturbate to spite him. Totally normal reaction, yes. So he calls her and he's like, you're not following instructions. You're not kneeling by the door like I asked, but also tell me what you're doing. What you doing? So she does and he's like, you're gonna ruin my leather chair. And again, I'm sorry, I have to ask. Uh, these are just things that I don't know about. Is that a thing? Do bodily excretions, wow, what a terrible word. Do they ruin leather? Is that a thing? So he tells her not to orgasm, but she does because she's a brat, which is what this is. So if you're into brat kink, this is your thing. And she thinks to herself that he's the snake tempting her out of Eden. And I'm like, hold on, wait a damn minute. Wait just a damn minute. We're combining a lot of lore here. <laughs> is the villain in this book going to be the Christian God? Is that where this is going? I mean, I'm not not interested in that. I'm just confused. But then she thinks about the, vi the book's real villain. Uh, if you're wondering who the real villain is, it's Prince Ali. I think it's time to say goodbye to Prince Abubu. Just kidding, that's not his name. He just goes by Ali. I don't know what his last name is. He is the guy that, that her dad, Balthazar, sold her to. And then Jafar killed her dad. And assumedly, Ali is next to get uh, assassinated right after Jafar comes back to the penthouse and assassinates Jasmine's... <sighs> No, I'm not gonna make the joke. So anyway, she's a brat <laughs> and is not kneeling when he comes home. So he busts in her bedroom door in his penthouse, just like he's about to bust in her, mm -mm, nope, Rachel stuff. And he's like, you didn't obey, but you want me to get mad and take it out on your pussy. And he, she's like, yeah, no shit. That's the dynamic. Hello. And he's like, all right, this game you like to play, it has rules. And if you're not going to abide by them, I'm not playing. AKA he is taking his balls and going home. Oh, Man, these jokes have got to stop. Stop it. New character arrives, Tinkerbell. Tinkerbell shows up at the behest of Jafar to dress her. She comes in with racks of clothes and she's like, yeah, I've got to dress you because you're going to the underworld. And Jasmine is like, what the fuck does that mean? And Tink is like, oh, the underworld, the sex dungeon where all the business deals in Carver City happen. Did I mention that this place is called Carver City? Anyways, Jasmine is like, so where's all my underwear? And J Tinkerbell's like, oh yeah, Jafar didn't order any, which, um, um, rude. And Tinkerbell's like, by the way, if you want out of this with Jafar, you could just make a deal with Hades. Now, one of my best friends, Hi Ali, is a fan of the series, so I already know that this series and Neon Gods overlap. However, it's not the same Hades. This Hades is the dad of the Hades and Neon Gods, in case you were curious. And this Hades rules the Carver City
Lady Underworld, which is a sex dungeon slash business making lace. Okay, remember how the audio was making me cringe less than the Neon Guides guy? This is mostly true, except when we hit 2 hours, 12 minutes, and 15 seconds, and then I wanted to be Thanos snapped out of existence. Here, join me in hell. You're so freaking bossy, Jafar. I should start calling you daddy. My cock goes so hard, I have to pause to keep from freeing it and driving it into her right here and now. You should. Okay, so when I say I have daddy issues, um, it is true, but personally, for me, those daddy issues did not translate into ending up with a daddy kink, um, so I don't like it. I don't like reading it. I'm happy for those of you who do, but um, I, I don't I don't enjoy it. So this is a rough reading experience for me, help. So they're in the shower fooling around, good for them, and she's calling him daddy, please kill me. And they finally have the conversation, finally, which this I'm actually happy about. They finally have the conversation about, okay, she likes this game of pretending that she doesn't want it, but she does, and then she can save her safe word if she really does not want it. And he's like, well, there's a right way to go about this, so let's do it the right way. So of course this translates into a lot of be a good girl talk, but at least we're establishing consent and shit verbally, so I'm happy about this. They um, don't actually have time to fool around though because they have to go play D&D, &D. and by d and D, I mean go to the underworld, so it's not Dungeons and Dragons, it's Dungeons and Dicks. I kind of wish it was called that in the book. At least that would have been funny. I feel like the conversation of terms and rules and like the bargain between them could have been better. There's not really a solid bargain there and I like bargains so I wish that that had been more fleshed out. If anything I just feel like this was all written in one go and it wasn't really like... <laughs> was it really like expanded upon. So they're in the underworld aka the sex dungeon aka D&D &D, and he tells her to keep her eyes down. That's her being a good girl. So I'm a little confused about how Katie Roberts worlds work because um, again we have the whole snake tempting her out of Eden piece and then we have a line that says the bartender looks Hispanic and then Meg Megara, yes Megara, um, shows up and it says she's wearing a purple dress that is al almost Grecian and Jasmine thinks but I suppose that to be expected with the theme of this place and the man who rules it, which is Hades. So I'm confused. Is this a world that is like ours? Where, but in, in Olympus, there are people with magic, but then the Christian, but then the Greece, Grecian bit of it. So there's, there's Greece, but then there's Hispanic people too. But then, so what is happening here. Anyways, Meg is into Jasmine and vice versa. We love bisexuality and Meg is like, I look forward to playing with you when your daddy allows it. And I'm like, I'm not really into daddy kinks. So this is very much not for me, but I do love a bisexual bitch. So cool. They meet Hades, who again is the dad of the Hades and Neon Gods. He's dead by the time Neon Gods happens, so his son is Hades and also runs an underground sex dungeon, so I guess it's a family business. Hades and Sons Dungeons and Dicks Incorporated. Cool, if you will. And Hades is like, Jasmine, if you ever want to make a deal, let me know. And Jafar's like, bro, shut the fuck up. Don't tell her she has a way out. And Hades is like, oh yes, I'm overstepping. Can't let your prisoner know there's a trap door. And I'm like, wait, did you mean to say trap door or did you mean escape door? Because a trap door is a is a tra is a trap. Are you saying you're a trap? Are you are you are you revealing yourself? <laughs> Or did you mean that you're an escape? Oh, okay. Hades mentioned, by the way, you staging a coup against Jasmine's father, Jasmine's father, not her daddy, because remember that title is reser reserved for Jafar. Hades is like, that coup was really bad for my Dungeons and Dicks business. And I'm gonna be honest, I don't really have a full good understanding of the uh, economics or politics of Carver City, but this is erotica, so that's not the point, and you have to be fair to a book based on what it sets out to be, and in this case, it's meant to be erotica. However, the plot girly in me wants so badly for everything to make sense and be wrapped up into neat and tidy little bows. That's not to say that plot is not important to erotica ever, it's just to say it's not the main focus of erotica. Now like Fourth Wing has politics and I do dock major points from that book because the politics is a major part of the book. Same with like other books like have to make sense because they're not erotica. Like Caraval doesn't make any fucking sense but like erotica doesn't have to fully make sense because it's not what it's setting out to do. Um, they run into somebody named Electo. No not the ninth but she's one of three women who answer to Hades and they're named after their mythological counterparts and that it says Hades takes his Greek ship it seriously and again so I'm confused are these people are or are they not 
the literal Greek myth people? Are they play acting? I don't know because like in Neon Gods again Hermes did have this like literal power of message delivery so I'm so confused. I don't know. They go into a playroom in the Dungeons and Diggory establishment and they're watching people act out scenes. He sits in a chair and puts her in his lap and she's overwhelmed because you know sex dungeon and he says relax baby girl and it's at this point I'm like okay he's starting to remind me of Massimo from 365 days saying that shit so often and that is another phrase I'm going to have to revoke access to for authors. Yes by the way I did watch that movie. Oh my god what the fuck. They have further conversations on what she might be into or open to doing together or with other people which is great. Great communication is super important. I have no complaints about this. I think more people need to learn to have this conversation um, both in real life with their intimate partners but also like having it depicted in books is like really important. I appreciate that. And then he starts finger fucking her. <laughs> while <clears throat> while he's having a conversation with Hook, yes, Captain Hook, he then has Tink, her personal stylist, show up in the sex dungeon and bring her a schoolgirl outfit and then sends her to a separate room with a desk. He's pretending not to be her father, again, because he's not her father, he's her daddy. He They're acting a fantasy out where she's in her dad's office and he's fucking her on her father's desk, which for me, the lines started to blur a little bit because again, calling him daddy just threw me off. And while he's then fucking her over a chair, because if you're in a sex dungeon, you might want to be versatile with your furniture, am I, am I right? Um, she realizes that the glass around them is not mirrors, it's windows, and the entire cast of every Disney movie can see her, Dumbo included. Not really. It's not like this guy is, is there either. But yeah, it's a bunch of people watching, including Meg, and she is into it. And that's fine. My only complaint here, again, is that this feels like the same exact thing that we, the same exact thing we did in Neon Gods, literally. So so while we're being like versatile with the furniture sex options in this sex dungeon, we are not being versatile in story, which is a bummer for me. And I realize that that's a hilarious ask for me to have of a series that is literally Disney villain smut, but I am who I am. She gets put to bed like a literal pillow princess, which honestly, pff, I envy her. And when she wakes up, gasp, yes, who is in her room? The villain. No, not the one she calls daddy. Silly goose. It's Ali. Prince Abubu. We are almost 60% into this book and he is just now showing up, which if this were actually supposed to be fantasy, I'd be like, what the fuck? Are you serious? But it's not. It's erotica. So we're going to give it a pass because it's not supposed to be great. Its first priority is not plot. Its first priority is to be titillating, which is objectively a hilarious word. And I think that for those who are looking to find a new book in the genre of erotica, where they're not necessarily looking for like a super intricate plot, which is fine. That's totally valid. It's a valid genre to read from. This might work for you. It's doing what it's supposed to do while giving them just enough plot to, you know, keep them feeling like there's, you know, not just sex and not just plot, but like a, a mixture. So for erotica readers who are looking for that genre, I think that this might, this book might work for you. But only if you're willing to read things that are like different. If you already read Neon Gods, then you might be kind of bored by this because it's kind of feeling too similar. I also want to point out, this is kind of unrelated. I'm sorry. I just have to say it. There is a literal daddy in the Aladdin universe who is super fine and it is literally Aladdin's dad. Aladdin and the King of Thieves is the superior Aladdin movie. I will hear no arguments about this. This cartoon man has no reason to be so fine. So moving on. Uh, that needed to be said. It was very important. Back to Ali. He's in this room. She's sleeping in and he's like, Jasmine, I'm gonna save you. Which at this point I'm like, is the next line gonna be, do you trust me? Do you trust me? What? Do you trust me? Yes. Because I feel like we're on thin ice already with the mouse, aren't we? If we have Ollie saying that uh, Donald Duck attorney at law is gonna pop in and issue a cease and desist order for possible copyright. Wait, did Katie Robert get permission from Disney for this? She might have, honestly. I don't know. I just, I'm just here to make jokes. Ollie's like, Jafar killed your dad. He shot him in the backyard like a dog. I'll save you. And then he kisses her and then he dips because apparently he just came to the sex dungeon full of bad guys to tell her that. Jafar shows up and was like, what's wrong? Did I hurt you? You didn't say your safe word, which is there to remind us that though they have kinky sex, it is all consensual, except she is still his literal prisoner, but all right. We don't really know Ali. We are just told by Jafar in his POV now that he just wants Jasmine to marry him and secure power. Like Ali wants Jasmine to marry him so that he can take over her father's area. And if he, we're told by Jafar, if Ali didn't think that 
that that was an option if Ali didn't think that Ali has no other reason of keeping J Jasmine alive other than that basically. And I just feel like we could have written this a little better um, to establish in the text that that was how Ali felt <laughs> and like show it rather than tell it. This is a seven and a half hour audio and we couldn't have taken 10 minutes to do an Ali scene where we actually established that our villain is a villain. All right. I just feel like I know Jafar's dick better than I know the villain of the book, which not great. And I must buy wits in. <laughs> Witching. They go to complain to Hades about the fact that somehow Ali got in to see Jasmine and Jafar's like, you let Ali have a membership here? And Hades is like, well, yeah, it's a sex dungeon, so. Jafar's like, he accosted Meg and Hades like, that's a lie. And Jafar is like, check the security cameras because apparently the whole sex dungeon is wired. Okay, so cameras prove Jafar right. So Hades says, sorry, and they leave. And at this point, Hades, what Jafar is like, I want Jasmine Jasmine to be a certain kind of way and still has not offered her like enough agency for me to really be comfortable and really there's really no reason for them to not just have a conversation where they're like making a deal I don't really understand and she kind of doesn't really want to talk about this because she's frustrated with him and he, he's like you have to tell me what's in your head and she said you have access to every part of me allow me a private thought from time to time which is true like I don't really understand why he makes so many demands of her and like keeps her prisoner and doesn't just offer her a fucking deal I, I don't know her experience with the again the sex dungeon allow her to glimpse the fact that life exists beyond you know being cooped up by her father and then her daddy um, and she says it's a whole new world out there Okay. Meg and Tink show up. Meg offers to give her money and a new identity and a way out. And Jasmine asks what price and Meg's like, oh, no price is just mutually beneficial. Right. Apparently the dynamic is like there's territories in Carver City. So they're all fighting over territory power. I don't know. Jasmine feels like maybe I should take the deal, but I feel like the other shoe is going to drop. So she asks, can I think about it? And Meg's like, you have a week to decide. Why? We don't know. She's considering the offer and she's frustrated um, that Jafar has like all the power in their dynamic. And again, I don't really understand why it's like this. He suddenly is like, I want you to go to college at some point, but also is thinking like, I want her to choose me. And she's like, bro, you don't give me any agency. Which again, this like in the Neon Gods book, she, the Persephone was given more agency. They were pretending she didn't have any and she was going to leave. That's the only difference in this and in this I'm not sure why she didn't have any agency I just don't really understand he finally starts asking her some questions about her because at this point they have not really gotten to know each other beyond sex and she explains that she wants to go to school for computer shit and has some ideas on how her father's business on empire certain parts of it were like outdated and she's like I can computerize things better and now we're at 78% through the book at this point and we are only hearing about these ideas she has for the first time this is only the second time she's ever brought up being interested in computers. I wish we could have done more character development with this. That would have been fun. Like we could have had better computer shit. Like we could have had it where she finds out that Ali is a member of the Dungeons and Dicks club by, you know, computer hackety hacking. There were opportunities. We just didn't take any of them, which is like really disappointing. They finally are verbalizing now that they need long-term plans. And Jasmine's like, um, give me some agency. Jafar's like, okay, let's look into giving, getting you like a tutor since you think that you're too far um, behind for college. You're like seven years behind. Let's, you know, get you like a tutor to learn about computer stuff here at home. And they're trying to figure out a way that she can pursue her dream and be part of the business empire. And honestly, I just wish that we'd had this conversation earlier. There's no reason not to have had this conversation earlier at all. There was nothing preventing them from having that conversation. And it was a great opportunity for character work and plot work, but that's the plot early in me. What can I say? Um, then they have a threesome with Meg. So I don't really feel like I need to go over that part. It's a threesome. Jasmine wakes up uh, all alone, contemplating the fact that Jafar um, <clears throat> pacifies her with orgasms the way one does a dog with treats. Cool. And she's like, I still don't feel free enough because I'm a prisoner. Like, I'm, I'm literally a prisoner. So even though we've had that conversation about getting me a little more agency, I'm still a fucking prisoner and I don't like that shit. So she calls Meg, who, by the way, she did just fuck the night before. And she says she wants to take Meg's offer. And Hades and Meg pick her up. And oop! 
Ali is there and yoink, yoinks her uh, back to her father's house where he's been hiding out. <laughs> Again, not her daddy, her father. Her father's dead. Ali has been holed up in her old house. Hades tells Jafar, he like he's like, yes, I did you dirty, but by the way, they're at Balthazar's house, just FYI. Ali is like, we're gonna get married. And Jasmine is like, no, we're not. We're not gonna do that. And he, she like tries to get close to him um, to like flirt her way into a position where she can kill him. And he's like, yes, you're definitely a prize. Harkening back to that whole conversation in the Aladdin movie where he's like, she's like, I'm not a prize to be won. That in this, Ali does think of her as a prize. And so she so, says to him, can I tell you something I've never told anybody? I would rather die than let you fuck me. And then she stabs him in the throat. Now, I just want to point out here, can I tell you something I've never told anybody? I would rather die than let Are we saying you've never told anybody you would rather die than let Ali fuck you? Because I feel like you made that clear to Jafar at least. I don't understand. Is this what? I just feel like this was written in one go. I'm sorry. I'm not trying to be mean. I just feel like this was written in one go and we needed to workshop little pieces of it, especially that. Like you could have just said, do you want to hear a secret? I would rather die than let you fuck me. Throat stab. Like, cause I feel like, I feel like even that makes more sense than can I tell you something I've never told anybody? Like, are we implying that she's never told anybody that she would rather die than let anybody fuck? I'd like, what? So to all of Ollie's men, she says, um, bend a knee or join him in being throat stabbed. And Balthazar's men, um, who, you know, her father's men, uh, one of them is like, not everybody's gonna follow you, but some of us might. And she's like, I'll take that, which I don't understand why didn't we, we didn't do this way sooner, but okay. Um, and she's sad that she stepped from role of prisoner into role of queen and is like, Jafar probably won't bend the knee. And I'm like, okay, but wait, can we have a conversation before we assume? Because like, he's fucked you several times and it's very clear he's into you. So like, why don't we just have a conversation and figure that out first? Like, why don't you give him a ring? Give him a ring. And again, a lot of this could have been solved with a simple conversation, which is like my least favorite favorite uh, shitty plot device. So Jafar shows up and is still assuming that she's in danger because he doesn't know Ali is dead. And she tells him, okay, bend the knee. And like a good Jon Snow, he does. And he says he's sorry because again, he has kept her literally prisoner. And she says, I'll be your equal or I'll be nothing. And I love you. Can you live with me being in charge? And he's like, marry me. And she's like, ask me again in a year. Meh. This was very anticlimactic. <laughs> this could have been reworked and been so much stronger. Like we could have had her being like a computer hacker. We could have cut down on the sex scenes. We re really didn't need the threesome. But again, that's coming from a reader who cares about plot very strongly. So that's why I like, I always am like rubbed the wrong way by erotica because I'm like, but you're not doing it right. You're not doing it exactly right. But they're just not doing it exactly right for me. So for what this is, I will give it a two and a half, but I really do wish that this had been done differently. But then again, if it had changed to the way I wanted it, I don't think it would be considered erotic anymore. Anyways, the very end is um, him being like, she sees me in a way no one ever has before. And she tells him, fuck me, daddy. And they fuck the end. So cool, cool, cool. So she lost her father, but gained a daddy, but not this daddy, which damn, what a shame, man. I might actually read that version of this book, not her fucking Aladdin's dad. Oh my God. I say that. And then I'd still be annoyed at the lack of plot progression in a way that feels satisfactory to me. Oh, there was a line that said, I make my way to the foyer, my dress leaving red marks behind me, which is a mood all on its own. And I'm like, damn, this last chapter went real downhill. You mean the dress leaving red marks behind you is a mood all its own? What? Come on, we can do better than this. That's okay. All right, fine. Okay, sure. <laughs> It's kind of channeling Alex Astor for me. I'm not going to lie to you. So that was Desperate Measures by Katie Robert. It's like a two and a half. It's all right. It's it's all right. If you like erotica, you might really love it. I just really wish that we had had better plot progression and character progression and then I might have liked it more. But again, like I'm not in daddy kink, so that's never going to be my thing. But if it is your thing and you like the idea of like sexy Disney villains and again, this scene, but make it like actually horny, um, you might like this. That's the review. Okay. Thank you so much for watching. Leave your comments and questions down below. I'm sure you have some questions. Sure you have some. Uh, and I will see you next time. Okay, bye. Hi, before I go, I have to say thank you for being a friend to my Therapy Bills patrons. And those are Alexander, Ali Magpie, Brittany Bobitney, Cami, Chris, Claire, Des Roberts, DJ Rocktopus, Ellie, Emperor's New Blues, Aaron, Eric, Carly, Jack and Jill, John E, Kaleen K, sorry, Casey McKenzie, Kate W, Caitlin M, Quinn, Lady Kittybug, Lex, 
Alice, Peggy Lou, Rain, Reese, SJ, Samar, Scarlet, Shiny, and SMK. Thank you all so much for being a friend. And last but not least, before I go to say thank you for being a friend to my Potato Search Marxist patrons, and those are AM Angel, Amanda, Andy, Angelica, Anita, Artie the Ninth, Ashley H, Ava, Ballads and Bookends, BB, Beck Blythe, Bookish Brain Rot, Bree, Brienne, Caitlin, Cardinal Ginger, Carlin, Cassandra, Catherine, Kathy, Chris, CJ, Cole, Colleen, Corwin, Corey, Darren, Deborah, Dex, Diet Goth, Dorian, Ebby, Ember, Emily A, Emily L, Emma O A, Aaron, Ezra, Hannah C, Hannah T, Harpy Kiro, Haley G, Ilianaka, India Inks, JM Tennant, J is on Olympus, JT, Jen Michelle, Jenny G, Jess Burler, Jessa Sue, Jillian, Jojo Bookish, Jess Pugsley, Kaylee, Kat, Catherine M, Katie, Katya, Kayala, Kendra, not another cowboy romance. Are you kidding me? <laughs> With a K, <laughs> Kylie, Lev and Cat Dog, Laura, Lazarus Ray. Y'all are killing me with your name changes on Patreon. <laughs> Library of Scars, Lisa V, LP, L oh man, LP, sorry. Loose Siri, Luna Moth, Lustful Octopus, Martin, Madison, Marcella, Marquita, Malara, MK Books, Molly, James, Nat, Natalie, Never, Nicole G, Nicole R, Nyan Binary, Paige P, Penny Chilling, Foxglove, Pixel Stars, Piratheon, Rachel B, Rat Sarah, Reba, Rebecca, Robin. Rosie Thorns, Rowan, Sicoria, Sadie, Samantha, Sarah C, Sarah H, Sarah the Bear, Shamed, Shannon, Sheen Onion, Sheena K, Sean, Talia, Three Old Dogs, Tiana, Tina, Toast, Trash Can Teddy, Tito Phoenix, Wildcat, and Ryder A. Thank you all so much for being a friend. Mm-hmm.